So, so welcome. Um, we haven't received any apologies for this evening. Um, and um, we're going to just review minutes, uh, matters arising from, from the last ones. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about what we've done this year. Um, and then treasurer report, and then at the end we'll do the election of the the chair and things. So, um, a quick refresh of the achievements that we've done. Oh, sorry, Louise, I probably should have missed out your slides. Sorry, it's Louise there. Sharon, can you um? Unmute Louise if possible. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Sorry, I didn't include your slides. I forgot. Uh, I didn't do any slides. Uh, was <laughs> I supposed to? <laughs> it was just to um, go over the minutes from the previous AGM and whether there were any matters arising from, from the oh. minutes. I, I don't oh. believe that there were any, but um, I just want to double check. Sorry, I don't think. No, I, I just sent you a link to where the minutes were, but uh, didn't do anything to make a slide about them. Sorry. That's OK. Um, if you can come double check whilst we're going through the rest of. Yeah, them. I've, I've literally just looked at them. I don't think there was anything on there other than um, the, the reports and the election of officers and thanking people who were standing down. And okay. the fact that you were standing for council, I think that was basically all that was on them. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Sorry to put you on the spot. That's okay. <laughs> Oops. So, wanted to sort of bring a highlight of some of the achievements. Um, we've actually achieved quite a lot considering the majority of it was online. Um, we managed to refresh our mission and, and purpose back in, in January. Um, and we've supported numerous online events, um, both doing events on our own, but I think doing a lot of things in partnership. Margaret has forever has managed to outdo everyone in the number of events that she's put on um, throughout the year, um, followed closely by um, the Scottish group. But uh, you know, we shouldn't forget that we've done multiple events with, with other BCS um, interest groups and with the council and with the FTAG and the software engineering. We've also done quite a lot with external partners, particularly, um, I'll come on to those ones in particular. Um, and then um, a lot of work on the AI accelerators and and Agile Inclusions. Um, the lovely colloquium was online again last year, um, but they still had 250 people take part, which I think is an amazing achievement. And you know, a lot of people um, and students involved, uh, members of the committee were, were um, some of the judges. Um, we had sponsors from all sorts of different people within the industry and and a lot of speakers so thank you again to Hannah and Helen and to Lancaster University for virtually hosting it last year. Then we've continued to build on our external partnerships so we've um, partnered up with Tech Up Women but I think this year it's just called Tech Up because they've actually taken on some um, male students as well. Um, and they've got software and data that we've been doing. Um, members of the committee are, I know, including myself and the mentors and Joe, Nicola and Rita have all been actually speaking or will be speaking in the near future. Um, again, we are tech women we've been involved with and a new one for us this year is coding black females and working with them to provide mentorships and to help them navigate their careers and do some career networking and as always we work closely with WISE um, to 
who has support us and vice versa. It's a symbiotic relationship that we have with them. And to acknowledge some of the successes we've had, the Computer Weekly is top most influential women. This year, we had two new people um, entering into the Hall of Fame. Um, Rebecca George, um, who's our immediate past president of BCS, and Sarah Burnett, who is um, the immediate past chair of BCS Women. Um, we've also had Rising Star um, with Nicola Martin, and then a number of us who were successful in, in the top 50. And a big thank you to, to Joe as well for being one of the judges. And I just wanted to um, touch on, and I said we had refreshed our, our mission. And our main mission is, is to attract, retain and empower women and people into the IT workforce. And we've this year tried to align it with what the BCS's strategy has been as well. Um, as we're a small organization it, uh, of volunteers, it's not always possible to, to do everything, but we, we decided that we would focus on supporting careers, sharing our expertise, and looking to see how we could improve education um, at all levels along the way. Is Tristy there now? If possible, Tristy, would you like to talk? She is, and I have just asked her to unmute, so hopefully you've seen that, Tristy. I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> and I was going to try to turn on my camera, but it won't allow me, so I'll just stay in the background with my voice. <laughs> so, um, yes, we um, have been really um, pleased to have access to um, the uh, BCS membership dashboard. So we were able to share some of our numbers here um, around our community. Um, it is a global community. Uh, we are predominantly in the UK, but we have 827 at the moment in BCS Women. Um, as you can see there, we have a good number of apprentices and students, which we're very pleased about. And of course, we have our stellar 87 fellows, which is really exciting. Um, our largest part of our membership is actually the uh, uh, CTIPS, uh, so the Chartered IT Professionals. Um, our international members um, go out through the US uh, into Asia um, and a couple, I think, in Africa. Uh, we, you can see here we have um, other numbers in the UK. We have 12 in Wales, 11 in Northern Ireland, and we have 426 unknown, which we're trying to break that down a bit. So we're still working on that, um, but they are in the UK. Um, so <laughs> um, lovely ladies and, and gentlemen that are BCS women members that are in the UK, um, you, you may be in that 426. Um, we have 306 members in England and of course 22 in Scotland. We're very proud of our, our membership um, everywhere globally. Um, I guess next slide. Um, and as part of our membership offer, we explored um, the different types of services and support that we provide our members. Um, so here we just have a few of the, the key ones that uh, came out in the survey that we did um, this year of our membership, which went out on LinkedIn and Twitter with the help of our, our uh, colleagues in the committee. Um, we identified that um, actually the membership shared um, the, the top areas that they were most interested in, and that was um, networking sessions. Um, they were looking for support in mentoring, uh, career transition, hands on experience um, through workshops, um, soft skills, uh, technical sessions. Obviously, there's a lot happening in the um, coding and programming space. Um, and role models, um, which looks like dancing figures there. So um, it was really fun to see that um, these are the things that we, we recognize as being important throughout our careers. Um, and it's good to see that um, other BCS women are, are looking for, for those same sorts of support. Um, 
on the back of that membership survey, um, we have set out a plan to look at running a, a series of taster sessions, which are really exciting. Um, they will be uh, led by our BCS Women Committee, as well as other members who are interested in, in doing that. Uh, we've gathered our lists and we're looking to check them twice and schedule them in over the next coming months. Um, we are looking to aim these sessions um, across uh, key areas of uh, returners, um, women and men over 50s who are looking to upskill, um, and also those that are early in their career uh, to help them think about maybe different paths they might have taken or, or they might take in, in technology. And of course, uh, we're looking to uh, strengthen and grow our partnerships to develop our role models um, approach. So, I don't know, I guess there aren't any questions going at the moment, so we'll go on to the next slide. Yeah, and, and I'd like to add, you know, if there's anyone who's on the call this evening that um, would like to run a taster session on whether it's technical or role models or soft skills, then please, you know, do drop us a line and let us know. We'd be more than happy to accommodate you. Yep. Um, and I can just, I'll put my uh, contact details in the chat so that you can email me. I am the membership secretary. Um, okay, on to the next one. Oh, and I probably should have mentioned that our return rate was about 10 to 12%. And I'm going to say it's, it's, a, it's a spam there <laughs> because there were some that were partially completed. So um, next slide. Okay. I don't know All if right. Joe's arrived yet. Is Joe? arrived and though she was enrolling her son in scouts so she may not if anybody had any questions about the survey we could go back to that if you like i don't see joe in the participants and she's not waiting in the waiting room to be admitted either so oh, it's okay um, I think well I, I i could i said that i would do it if needs be so um thank Thank you, Tristy, and thank you, Sharon. Um, just to touch on, on the budget briefly, um, we had a budget of um, 7,800 um, last year. Um, obviously, because of the pandemic, we didn't spend anywhere near that amount. Um, the majority of our spending um, went on the Lovelace Colloquium and getting prizes and getting sponsorships and all sorts of different parts for that. Um, and this year our budget has been revised to around about £6,790. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions on that. If they do, let us know. Yeah, an easy time, Andrea. Yeah. So we're on to the elections now um, we actually because it's online we have actually got people to propose and second before before the um, actual AGM today um, but we also have to honor the people that are attending now and so that um, if anyone objects could they raise their hand and explain why so I'll give you a couple of minutes to respond. It's looking good, Andrea. <laughs> maybe we should maybe we should throw in the threat if anyone if anyone objects then they, they also have to take up the position i'm not sure if that's written into our constitution or not but <laughs> uh, louise has raised her hand <laughs> could you I go. It? oh i'm trying no, i'm trying <laughs> apologies there we go sorry i was hit the wrong button I, I was, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I was yes. just going to say that on our table and in um, our document that we're going to put in the minutes, we have actually got um, a proposer and seconder for the rest of the committee. That's on the, um, my next slide. 
Oh, is it? Okay, right. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're too keen. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem at all. Okay, I'm going to go to the next one. So, um, so the existing committee, um, we haven't actually, although we've asked for new members, we haven't actually received any um, applications apart from the two for the early careers side of things, but um, we were a bit late getting back to them to ask them for their um, proposers and seconders. So in fairness to them, we're going to review those next week. So again, if no, no one objects. So before we've got a bit of time before the panel events. Um, so you can either get a quick refreshment or we're open to um, any questions that you may have based on what you've seen. Not, not seeing any hands. Yeah, I would recommend folks go and have take. Oh no, take that back, Tristy. I think you've got a hand. There we go. Do you want to say something? Hi, Sharon. Thank you very much. I just wanted to say it's really exciting to see so many people in the audience. So I do hope that people aren't too shy <laughs> and actually do say hello. Um, it's lovely to see new faces um, and to hear um, the folks that have come to join us tonight. So just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Mm. And I, I would also like to um, do a special thank you to Tristy and Hannah and Joe and Nicola for all the help that they have put in to do, coordinate the survey, because I think, you know, it wasn't an easy task and um, getting everything sorted. So thank you. Um, and I think we've got five minutes before we will actually start. I'm going to leave that to you. I'm going to put myself on mute, Sharon. Yeah, we we do um, we do indeed have five more minutes. Now we gave people the option of joining at six thirty, so it would be rude for us to to get started now and have them miss the start. So, um, and we can never quite tell how long the AGM will take. Um, I joined the Edinburgh branch one, and I think they did it in fifteen minutes, which was record time. Um, I, uh, so I guess I'll just pop my video on um, as I speak to everyone. Um, yeah, we weren't quite, weren't quite sure. All I knew was that I would be cutting Andrea short at half past six if that's um, what was necessary. So it hasn't come to that. But like I say, recommend you go cup of tea, coffee, drink of your choice. I've got an apple juice. It looks like a can of gin and tonic, but it is actually just apple fizz. Um, uh, make yourselves comfortable and um, you'll see us in, in five minutes. Uh, well, what we'll do is we'll have the screen up so you'll get to see all the, all the authors of, of our book. And um, and you get to see some our, our, our faces rather than just uh, see some random blank screens. Um, um, as uh, Tristy said, we would really welcome people's uh, questions. I have a few to get us started if they are, well, I'll maybe get us started. I have a few more if there is there's nothing from the audience, but I'm expecting that there will be um, uh, quite a number. So please um, uh, don't hold back, but I will repeat all of this when it gets to half six and we've got our new um, attendees joining then as well. Margaret's raised her hand. Oh, good spot. Hi, Margaret. Hopefully you can um, join in now. Just actually, if I um, uh, can actually do a quick plug, uh, because of uh, Thinking Pink of Scotland, COP26, and one of the things that uh, the part of the BCS FTAG are doing is coming up with a couple of competitions 
the natural of time with COP26. Closing date end of November, so a few weeks ago, just um, which is a little bit longer than the COP26. But um, it, one is actually uh, to come up with the idea of a strap line or a tag. So uh, to do really, what do you think about sustainability, etc.? What I'm going to do is put in the chat uh, the chat box the link to it. So this is just purely for uh, BCS members, or you could do it with your friends, but one of them has to be a BCS member. Uh, you, there is one for a class for undergraduates, postgraduates, and one for FE. So that's one competition, a tweet or a strap line, 140 characters, what does sustainability mean to you? Uh, now, the other competition is designed for primary schools right through to postgraduate. And again, on a single PowerPoint, what does sustainability mean to you? So again, I'll put the link in for this one. Uh, again, closing date, 30th of November. What we really want to do is have at least 26 entries in each class for COP26 for obvious reasons. And uh, so far we have one entry. It's a bit sad, really. So uh, if you've got a stray three or four minutes, you can maybe come up with a strap line. Uh, and the idea with the BCSF tag is possibly to produce an ebook, and some of the entries will actually be a part of the illustrations to do with more technical papers in the ebook. So do enter and do if you've got any connections with schools, universities, etc., do please encourage them. So I'll just finish my plug and I'll put the links in um, in the chat. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks for that, Margaret. Um, I've just added Shilpa. You should hopefully, Shilpa, have the ability to put your video on. We're about to get started in a minute or so. Um, I'm spotting that the participant numbers is, are, is growing, are growing numbers. Anyway, we're getting more people joining us. Um, and uh, so we will probably get started just a minute or two after 6.30. Um, I am being a complete novice and can't work out how to get just our six panelists or I'm on the screen. It seems to be everybody or um, or just one person. I think you should concentrate on the person who's speaking. Okay. Fine. So I think the video will switch between. Right. Um, would you like me to put the starter poll up? No, let's wait until we've got everyone just... Okay. Um, we'll wait until we've got more people. Yeah. We're expecting... We had about 100 registered, is that right? We did indeed. So okay. in the... In the, in the um, with the recognition that not everybody comes that says they would, because such as virtual events, and yes. sometimes in-person events, um, um, but uh, then, yeah, the numbers are growing. Um, so we'll give everyone a couple more minutes to get joined. I'm recognizing a few names, some I haven't seen for 20 years, I think. That surely um, can't be possible, Sharon. Uh, I know, I know. I, I went I went straight to work from, from the cradle, um, <laughs> as did they, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> It's their friends from nursery. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, so yeah, for folks who are just joining, we're just giving everyone a, a minute or two to get in. I'm not having to admit anyone, so at least that is speeding up the process. Everyone's just adding, adding automatically. We're expecting maybe, maybe a few more before we get started, but we will start soon um, and uh, give you a chance to to ask any questions, everything you ever wanted to know about women in tech. Uh, no, on, I, I nearly added a no holds barred conversation, but there, there might be some limits as to what we, we talk about. Right, it's, it's, it's kind of staple at the moment. Shall we just get going? Looking for a nod from somebody else. There we go. Andrea's nodding. Fantastic. Right. So everybody who's joined, uh, um, uh, a huge thank you um, for 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 joining us this, this evening. Um, as many of you will have heard me witter on already, um, we are now here to discuss um, everything you ever want to know about women in tech. Um, and perhaps we're afraid to ask before, but um, we really want to encourage 
uh, interesting conversations this evening. Um, I know that a lot of what's the, what they say about that, you know, let's get comfortable being uncomfortable. Maybe, maybe sometimes it's asking those tricky questions that we want to give you a safe space to be able to do that. So that really is the part of the purpose for this evening. So um, joining me are um, five of the other author, authors, it still feels very weird to say that, of, of, of this Women in Tech book. I have brought props this evening um, and uh, I carry it everywhere I go. Isn't that sad? Well, it's not quite true. I carry it in my work bag, um, which means every two weeks I go to London, it goes to London with me. But anyway, um, we have the authors and the, an opportunity for you to ask questions about their experiences, about why they got involved in the book, why we got involved in the book, um, anything in particular that really matters to us, tips, all sorts. I do have some questions pre-prepared. Um, I will maybe ask one or two of them to get us started, but then it really is up, up over to you. I will do my best at managing that part as well. So um, if you want to ask a question, you can just put it in the chat if you'd like to put it in the chat. If you're very happy happy to um, um, add some audio to that then pop your hand up and I will um, I will ask you to unmute and then you can ask your question to to the six of us as well now um, before I get all the authors to introduce themselves because we will do that take a minute or two to do that we have a poll for for our attendees this evening um, Hannah um, um, very kindly did this at the last minute because I had completely forgotten about it. Um, so um, Hannah's really in charge of that. Hannah, I'm going to let you introduce um, how we can all find the poll. You should have just said that we've had this prepared for ages, Sharon, and nobody would have known. Um, so it's a two-stage poll, right? The first stage, which I'm about to share now, you should be able to see is for the women in the room. We have some men in the room, so but we'd like you to hold back and we're going to give you exactly the same questions once we've had this filled in. So for the women in the room, you should all be on some kind of computer because you're watching this. So you've got a phone or a computer or something. If you go to www.menti.com on a device, it could be a little portable device, you know, or it could be the computer that you're on. You should see this poll. And um, I'm just going to do that myself. And you will be able to fill in the answers yourself. So the code is 8884 9821. Hannah, what if all of them apply? Tick them all, mate. Tick them all. It won't let me. Won't it? No. Well, pick the worst one then. <laughs> so, I, 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 the beginner's mistake. I've obviously set this so, so you can only choose one. <sighs> Honestly, you just can't get the staff these days, can you, Sharon? <laughs> yeah. But but I, I did say we did it last minute, so that gives us an excuse. See if we'd been really prepared if and then still really not quite done it, you know. Better, but there you go. <laughs> um, I, think, I think the important take-home message from this is that with you ask the women in the room whether these things have occurred, you'll find that most of the women will have had at least one of them. Um, I know that for me personally, some of them haven't happened for a while, right? So I think I could quite clearly remember the last time someone sent me to make the tea um, and it just, I, my jaw hit the floor. Honestly, I was so surprised to, at that career stage that I was in then, be told to go and make the tea for the men, but it happens. And I think that's something that maybe the guys don't realize. I don't know if anybody else has been asked to make the tea recently. Not recently. <laughs> but you have, though, haven't you? I have, yes. Yeah. Similarly been mistaken for the receptionist because there was myself and the CIO, who was also female, um, sitting on the table, but there was one guy, and people used to go to him all the time, even though he was more junior than us. Yeah. Huh. I keep, I've been phoned up and people have said, can I speak to Dr. D? And I said, I am Dr. D. And they've been, oh, I'm sorry. 
there, there's some really good chat going on. So, um, so one person said, I don't mind making the tea as long as everyone else takes a turn. And I think, uh, absolutely. Um, however, um, yeah, I think often that's not how it's intended. Um, there, there, Joe, I love Joe's comment. I've had all this happen to you. My favourite isn't on the list, repeatedly being called the name of the only other woman in the project. Oh. Um, um, you'd think that if there's only two women, they'd remember you well. That's, that's irritating. Um, um, somebody, I spotted it, but it's whizzed past, said, um, just make the tea so badly that it never happens again. Um, which is lovely. Pete's actually been a receptionist, which is unusual, he believes. It probably okay. is, actually. Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, lots of experiences. Oh, yeah, Jo, jo was the boss at the time. Excellent. So not only did they call her somebody else's name, but she was the boss, then you think they should have known. Lovely. Okay, okay. So for the guys, we ready for the next slide? So we should be able to say, now, for the guys, you can answer the same question. How long do we give them? How many guys have we got in the room? That's another question. I probably should have checked before we. There all... is a handful. There is a There's handful. A handful. Of, okay. Um, or certainly, I would make that assumption from people's names. That might not necessarily be the case, but um, yeah. but yes. Oh, there we go. Oh, excellent. Yes. Mm. I think the comment that you just make the tea really badly so you don't get asked to do it again. I think I have actually seen people use that strategy with regard to minutes. So sometimes you read the minutes of a meeting and you think the person taking these minutes either doesn't know how to take minutes or is really trying not to be given the job again. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Well, okay. we I, I'm fairly sure we have more than five yeah. um gents in the or in the uh, our participants. So there you go. Um okay. I think I was... it, it better spread this time though. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna stop sharing and we can move on to the main event um, now. I just I, nice I got kick I've, off I've had with a, a bit of silly. Yeah, I've had a I've had a private message from somebody who I'm gonna no, I'm not gonna name their name, but just to let people know that that they were taken off a leadership course because they had recently told their work they was pregnant, and their work made the decision that they would have forgotten everything by the time she came back from maternity leave. Um, yeah, that's that's interesting. Anyway, there we go. Right, let's get started. Let's get started. So we'll do some introductions to to the authors. Um, I, I have um, I've written everyone's name in alphabetical order um, of their first name. So um, Andrea, do you want to introduce yourself again and just tell people a little bit more about um, you as well? Um, yes, so I'm Andrea Palmer. Um, I'm the chair of obviously of BCS Women, um, but I also sit on the council. Um, the Society Board and the FTAG, so heavily involved with the BCS at lots of different levels, um, have been passionate about um, diversity and inclusion and equality and equity for, for a long time now and, have, and also volunteer um, for another company um, looking at how we can address gender equality in the workplace. Um, for my day job, I'm a consultant focusing primarily on business change. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And Clem, you're next. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Clem Herman. I am Professor of Gender and Technology at The Open University. Um, I have been involved in many, many initiatives and research projects and um, and educational um, interventions to try and support women into IT. Um, so that's that's predates my time as an academic at the Open University. Um, I ran an organisation called the Women's Electronic Village Hall during the 1990s, which was um, a place where women could come and learn skills and use computers in those very early days of internet access. Um, so, yeah, a bit of a lifelong passion for me, and um, I continue my work, and, and it's great to be collaborating with 
um, these great colleagues from BCS on, on the book that we worked on. Thank you, Clem. Gillian. So um, I spent most of my life being a technical person, but around about 10 years ago, I left IBM and, uh, and um, started my own company. I did a few things with it, but at the moment we are uh, mostly doing recruiting of women into technical roles and then helping organizations to understand how to make that really happen through unconscious bias training and recruitment training and all sorts of stuff. Uh, and I also have a, a, a quite an active role in the BCS. I sit on the learning and development board and trustee board, and I attend council whenever I can. Um, and dead passionate about women in tech and have been for the last 25, 30 years. So a real passion for me too, Clem. Fab, thank you. Now, Hannah, let's bring you back if you want to introduce yourself, please. Hi, uh, I'm uh, Hannah D, and I'm a senior lecturer in computer science at Aberystwyth University. So I teach computing at the moment, and I'm seem to be teaching databases for some reason to uh, undergraduates and postgraduates. Uh, and I do research into robotics um, and computer vision. Uh, but also, I do lots of stuff with BCS women and women in tech in general. Um, and I try and get kids enthused about computing through things like robot club and after school things. And I also set up the Lovelace Colloquium, which is the main thing for undergraduate women. So I kind of do stuff with younger women in tech, mostly students and younger. Fab, thank you very much. Right, um, although Sharon comes before Shilpa, Shilpa, I'm going to get you to introduce yourself before I then do a quick intro to everyone too. No problem. Hello, everyone. So I'm Shilpa Shah. I'm a director at Deloitte in our human-centered transformation practice. I've been with the firm for over 24 years and I love solving complex problems. I'm focused on public sector and healthcare. I also lead our Women in Technology Network and have done so for the past 16 years or so and our consulting inclusion think tank and sit on the Institute of Coding's uh, industry advisory board. And Women in Tech has been a long time personal passion of mine. And um, like Hannah, focus across uh, the range, starting with the very young and trying to inspire the next generation to come and join us in technology because technology really needs a diverse set of voices, but also um, working within our own organization around uh, retention and um, thinking about new talent models that we can bring into the organization as well. And it's never too late to return and retrain into tech. Um, Mum of two teenage girls who are passionate about technology as well and part of my motivation for wanting to continue to drive change in this space. Brilliant, thank you very much. And last, um, me, I guess, um, the voice you've been hearing since we got started, maybe I should have just introduced myself at the start. So Sharon Moore, I, for a day job, work for IBM. I'm our CTO for public sector in the UK, um, which is so much fun. I'm, I really get a lot of, oh, a lot of reward um, I'm, I'm, I, out of just that opportunity to potentially make a difference with technology in a sector that really, really, really needs help it and work with a, a number of, of, of people also wanting to do the same thing. Um, for, for those who um, know that I'm in the sales organization, my job is, job is still very much as a technologist. Um, I, uh, yeah, there's, there's, <laughs> There, there's a bit of a stigma around about the sales thing, but actually I think it's that opportunity to influence and evangelize about the good that technology can do. So um, that that's that's me, day job, being involved in BCS Women for just about 10 years now. I was um, saying to Gillian in a conversation earlier today that um, in, in June um, of next year, that will be 10 years that I got involved really actively doing something and we ran an event in Scotland. So although I guess it's fair to say I probably was active a couple of months before the event actually happened. Um, so yeah, been involved in, in, in BCS for a while, mostly through BCS Women, but largely getting more involved now through council and trustee board and looking for opportunities to really help BCS change the industry from and make it more inclusive um, 
anyway, enough about me. Um, I have my very first question. I've already, there's ones to me directly already that I will make sure get asked. Um, but Gillian, I'd just like to start with, right, this is, this was, it was your fault, right? This is your fault. <laughs> so tell us why you had the idea. Um, I know it was a huge amount of work to make it happen, but why, why did you want to, to, why did you want to create a book? You know, in, I, I'm really worried now. I'm worried that I'd be nicking somebody else's idea. Having seen that poll with all of us saying, oh, I had my idea pinched. I'm sure we were talking about it when I was leading BCS with me back in 2000 and I don't know, 11, 12. I'm sure we were talking about it. I know for certain I talked to Margaret about it and I talked to Sarah Burnett about it. And we just kept saying, we'll do this, we'll write a book, we need to write a book, because it's not always clear to companies what steps they need to take and what the issues are. And, and there's this big thing about, well, why should we bother anyway? So there's a business case issue that needs explaining so that companies can share that amongst the senior echelons and and see that there's a there's a true motivation that aligns with their profit motive or revenues or whatever it is that's driving them and so i'm sure we've been saying it for ages that we'd write it and yeah it was my fault that we kind of finally got down and and did it and then it was painful, wasn't it? Wasn't it all of you? Look at that, look at that. It was it was particularly painful when I was in the camper van and that pair of underwear were just here on that Zoom call. Do you not remember all that? In that <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was hard work. It was a good uh, probably 18 months that we spent on it. So and and you know, we I, I think eventually we're really pleased with it but it was hard it was um it wasn't an easy an easy job to do part of the thing is because there's there's so much to say isn't there um mm. i think that's that's a tricky thing as well as just the, the time side of things but thank you very much for actually getting us going and we I know there's a huge amount of work for you in particular behind the scenes with everything else not just the the authoring of it so huge thank you to you jillian for actually making no, i was casting well. it all off on you actually i wasn't doing anything <laughs> i was like oh shilpa can you do this and claim help <laughs> so Brilliant. Right. So for those who participated, um, um, why did you want to get involved? Now, I'm not going to ask the same question to everybody because um, we'll end up with time, the time's run out and we've hardly said anything. So um, forgive me if um, uh, I don't ask everybody the same question. I think we knew that was going to happen anyway. Um, if you particularly want to jump in on something, please um, um, just do that. Um, before I get the opportunity to, to show other people's names. So, and I, I can see for some reason, Chilpa, you've come up on my screen. So I'm just going to ask you that question. Why did you want to get involved? Oh, brilliant. So um, as Gillian was saying, I think we'd been talking about it as a group for some time. And we were talking always about the challenges and opportunities for better gender diversity and technology. And we used to share some of the things that we were all doing individually. Um, and we thought, what a great idea to use our kind of collective experience and guidance to help other people on, on their own journeys. I think it's, you know, for, for too long, we kind of think, oh, everybody else must be doing this, but actually they, they, they really weren't. So there are a lot of great organizations out there. There's lots of articles, there's lots of information, and sometimes there's just too much. So putting it all together um, in a book, because I think there's still something about physically carrying a book around with you and that you can dip in and out of, was something I think um, really attracted me to wanting to participate. Um, and the other thing was, of course, being able to work with such fabulous esteemed uh, colleagues um, to be able to get this thing out there. Um, and, you know, wanting to help others. I think, you know, somebody who's been in the brownies and the guides and a ranger, as I did, you know, my whole life from a personal perspective, you think if I know something, if I can help somebody, why wouldn't you do that? So working together with amazing colleagues and sharing experiences to help other people accelerate their journeys was really a big draw for me. Do we do we have any um, slightly different experiences or different answers to that question? I, I can see everybody, so I'm looking for nods or shakes. Uh, Hannah's popped her, yes. So Hannah, why don't we go with you and then Clem will ask you the same question too. So why did you want to get involved, Hannah? Thanks, Yopa, by the way. Um, am I, sorry, you can hear me right, good. Um, so for me, 
I, Jillian was talking about the book and I said that I thought it's really important if you're writing about this stuff to talk about sort of why we're one of the reasons we're in this situation and that is to do with um, technology and computing in schools and for younger people and having said that this was something that was important that we cover Jillian said well why don't you write it then and then I was in a corner and that was that No option, I love it. <laughs> Clem, you popped up your hand as well, I think. Yeah, I mean, sort of a little bit similar to what Hannah was saying, but, um, but, I, but I see that as a really positive thing, that this, to work with, I, I've been doing research in this area for a really long time, and often, as academics, we write papers, and then other academics read them, and uh, you know it's sort of really important, and it's uh, you know I'm not I'm not saying that's not an important task, but we don't often get the chance to cross those boundaries between industry, education, and um, training and schools and so on. And what I loved about this project is that we brought together this real range of experience. We're coming from different places, and we've all worked in our own almost silos doing the work that we do. But this way we were able to expand across um, having, bringing together really different perspectives. And what I've enjoyed as well is the discussions that we've had and the way that we've looked at each other's chapters and commented on them and so on. And that, that was a really kind of uh, collaborative and productive sort of um, process. So really, really, really enjoyed that. Jillian just waved her hand. I think one thing I would say is that we've, um, it's, a, it's a brilliant opportunity to learn from one another, I think, you know, um, so I don't think, I, it's maybe a bit of a presumption, but I, I suspect that everybody that was involved learned something um, as, they were, as they were doing this. And Gillian, did you want to add something? Yeah, no, just um, Clem reminded me that the, it's not just us five, really. It's all the people who reviewed it for us and that yeah. learning about, you know, um, other perspectives just from the reviewers going no you can't put that and then having to go back and whilst you know that you know it you then have to go and justify it and you have to go and find the references for it and and that was really important and, and so thank you to all the reviewers if you're online because because it was so important to to give us that rigor it was just brilliant yeah, that's a really, really, really good point, Gillian. Um, and while I've got you on the screen, so one of the, my, my, my next question I had on my list was um, unconscious bias, how destructive is it? Now, you and I both um, uh, contributed to, to that particular part of the book. And, you know, I've, I've seen some of the effect of microaggressions and we know that that's part of the reason that women leave IT is the microaggressions where people make assumptions, like some of the stuff that we've had earlier, we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. taking the minutes, um, being interrupted, that kind of thing. Now, we're not saying this doesn't ever happen to men, but habitually it happens far more to women. Um, and um, yeah, it can be a real problem. Um, Gillian, do you want, would you mind talking a little bit more about unconscious bias? Right. And your dead right. I mean, McKinsey do a paper every year and their September paper this year was with oh what's her name lean in um the the lean in organization Cheryl Sandberg yeah. Cheryl and they they were saying how many times was a woman doubted how many times was a man, man doubted in their lives and and they'd done a massive survey on it and showed that you know, um, a woman was much more likely to be challenged in her technical opinion, in her technical in the very broadest sense, you know, technical how in, in your opinion as an accountant or, you know, in your opinion as a salesperson. Um, but, but, you know, a woman was far more likely to be challenged and then a woman of colour was even more likely to be challenged. So, you know, it's, it's desperately important that we get people to understand how their biases might affect their perception of others because actually you know a lot of it is so not malicious it just affects your per perception of others and therefore you may doubt them just a little bit more and each time 
that an individual is doubted or each time their idea is nicked or they get asked to make the tea, that's another nail in the coffin. And, and eventually they go, oh, you know what? I'm gonna leave this industry. And it's so hard for us to win women into the industry that we desperately don't need them to be leaving just because we didn't get our biases controlled. So, so for me, this is, fundamental and key and really important. I found the talk over one really frustrating, um, partly because I was in a board meeting and it happened not when I say talk over, sorry, my idea repeated. I was in a board meeting and we were discussing something that was a concern and most people were, were focusing on one concern. I had another perspective that was also a problem. Um, it made my case, the chap two to my left then said more or less exactly the same thing I'd said, um, rephrased the words a little. And then later on in the meeting, it was his point. It was actually somebody else in this board meeting made reference to him. And I remember being so angry. I was like, I never thought it would happen to me. I thought I was, you know, a bit outspoken and and particularly in those sessions where I didn't say anything unless it really mattered. So being very frustrated but I think it's happened in my personal life as well to the point that I even had um, um I even um spoke to somebody in, about the volume of my voice and whether I just wasn't speaking loudly enough um because I, I'm a particular a group of friends um where the what happens is generally when they get together the men speak and the women speak together which a little, frustrates me a little bit that's kind of what happens but if we do sit as a group um often I will find myself making a point or making a joke or making a remark and it is made again by one of the men like honestly it gets me very frustrated anyway I will just get off my personal soapbox there um but it it, it it is damaging and I think maybe that's maybe that's um one of the points we could make to the um, the folks around us who identify as men in this audience that actually if you could pay for more attention potentially to the women in the room particularly as there aren't that many of them usually but also um potentially help amplify them be an ally, so, be the yeah. ally yeah. to the women. So, you know, when you are paying more attention, then if you hear a woman's idea being pinched, or if you hear a woman being yet again asked to take the minutes, you know, and it's you see this individual repeatedly be asked to take the minutes, be her ally and and stand up for her and say, well, isn't it time that, you know, someone else took the minutes or didn't we just hear that from Sharon? You know, this is just, it's just allyship, that's all. Can we also ask them to, you know, sometimes, you know, people have ideas, but um, a lot of us will just sit back and, and wait politely to, to we actually say to till it's our turn. And then someone else will have said something and you may well have had that idea. But actually, rather than the same voices being heard all the time, ask that quietest voice in the room first. If you're chairing a meeting, ask for someone else to contribute because they may have a really good idea that gets totally missed because they're actually sitting back and just waiting their turn politely. I mean, I know a guy who flew all the way to Italy for a business meeting and didn't realise that the Italians all talk over each other and came back having not spoken and delivered the message that he'd gone there for. Yeah, but this happens to women all the time. They sit there quietly waiting their turn and the meeting's over and nothing happens. So important. And I, I, everyone's waiting very patiently, I think, on, on this. You, the, the, the panel on the, um I, I so we have a couple of questions from um from the audience that have come directly to me so um don't forget folks feel free to pop up your hands if you want to ask anything it doesn't need to be with the flow of what being um, talking about um I see that Armin's done that immediately. Would you mind if I um, go with a couple of questions? In fact, I'm not going to even give you the option. I'm not going to unmute you yet. I'm going to ask the couple that have come to me first and then we will come to you. So I see that hand and we will, we will come to you. So um, first of all, um, one has come from, from a, um, a man in our audience. Um, what more can senior IT male execs do to help promote more women in tech? Um, and in particular, um, if you're working for a company that has maybe not got an American or a UK culture awareness, um, what cultural tech, tip, tech tips can you, you give around um, 
promoting more women in tech, especially that um, the Asian sector? So I guess that's two questions there. Let me try and repeat them in a way that doesn't sound like I'm reading them anymore. So one, what can senior IT men do about um, promoting more women in tech? And um, for those companies that are not necessarily um, UK or um, American in their in their culture, what do we specifically need to do about them? So anyone fancy taking one or two of those questions? We've already just talked about allyship, and I think that's incredibly important. Andrea, on you go. I, I can start, and I'm sure there's lots of other people who <laughs> will also contribute. And I think for me, one of the big things is, you know, we don't generally, women don't apply for roles unless you can do at least 70 to 80% of what's on the role. And if you're not going, if you're not getting a diverse pool of, of candidates, you know, maybe you actually need just to tap a woman on the shoulder and say, you know, I think you would be good for this and put them forward for the role and encourage them and give them some mentorship or advice on how to, how to actually apply for the role but um and if they're not successful I the other part is to make sure that they actually receive feedback um so that they know what they can do to improve next time um you know, and you know one of the guys one of my mentors he actually came to me and said are you not applying for this role and I said no I don't think it's I'm I can do that and he says but you can and he said what, how would you feel if so-and-so got this role? And I said, well, I'd be really annoyed. And he said, exactly. So therefore, you need to apply for it. But sometimes we don't do it because we're going, no, I haven't, I haven't got all those skills. And so, you know, I think one of the things I learned, I mean, it's from Gillian, is, is pushing myself forward. And sometimes we have to also, as women, have to do things to, that are outside our comfort zone. But we need people to give us a safe environment in which to do that yeah thank you very much anyone else want to add to on that particular question I've got um I think I'm going to come to you yeah, well you go Clem I was going to come to you Clem anyway so there we go <laughs> um yeah I wanted to pick up on the on the second bit of the question which was about a non-UK non-US companies uh and the sort of I'm not sure if I heard the question exactly right, but I almost felt like the sort of implication was that US and UK companies actually know what to do and maybe there's a problem with other parts of the world. And I just wanted to sort of give uh, so talk a little bit about some research that I did with which was a comparative project between UK and India, because we wanted to look to India uh, in particular around the recruitment of women um, and particularly in the um, in the tech sector in in ba Bangalore and uh, around that area huge um, numbers of women have entered IT um, and there has you know there's sort of much more uh, gender balance in terms of the numbers of women entering the IT sector and what we what we observed there were and doing a lot of interviews with the women was um, around how much they felt that they were actively proactively welcomed um, uh, in in many ways. So you know there were things like on-site nurseries. There were sort of so sort of quite practical things, but also the advertising and recruitment was positively directed towards women, and it was seen as a very um, women friendly place to go and work and I think you know so I think we can get into this kind of polarization and think you know US and UK culture is that we've got so much kind of diversity initiatives and so on that we're sort of stride ahead but we've actually got to look perhaps at what we can learn from other places where they're doing better in terms of numbers for sure. Thanks. And actually, Leslie um, has popped in the chat that her previous company had a much better gender balance also in management in the 
oh, it's just appeared in the tech sector in the Indian offices. So yeah, unfortunately, the UK and the US doesn't necessarily have it sorted. Um, I got to um, read um, some of that research, Climb River, and uh, yeah, it was really interesting just to see um, where, where the challenges are and, and let some of them overlap. Um, I just thought, um, as, as a male exec, I thought it might be worthwhile knowing, I, I will come to you, Shilpa, sorry, um, um, a, it might be worth understanding it. when it comes to hiring into, into teams. This was something that was in um, the chapter that Andrea wrote and it astonished me. So um, if you're, um, when you're hiring, um, let's just say that um, if we go, we, we go, I'm going to divide into four. So if we have three women and one man um, who are in the, comp the finalist pool for a role, then the likelihood of hiring a woman is 67%. If you've got two women and two men in, in your um, finalist pool, then you've got a 50% chance or likelihood of hiring a woman. But if you have one woman and three men, you have a 0% chance of hiring a woman, which is really interesting. So um, we, while we absolutely would utterly support hiring the right person for the job, it's let's, maybe we all need to do a bit more work on making sure we've got the right, um, the right composition of, of candidates that we're, that we're um, looking at, that we're interviewing and and so on for, for the roles. So that's maybe something to, to bear in mind as well. Shopa, do you want to add something? Um, I was just gonna say, so whoever asked the question um, is definitely demonstrating one of the C's. So I kind of like to think about, you know, giving our um, male colleagues um, uh, three C's that they need to think about. So one is caring. And by asking the question, you know, hopefully you're demonstrating that you're actually caring. And by that, I mean, taking the time to actually listen to your employees. Um, I think it's just such an un undervalued thing and people just don't pay enough attention to it. So, you know, whether that's providing anonymous mechanisms, whether that's having one-to-ones, whether that's having ERGs, different ways of, you know, listening to um, the people around what they would need to feel more supported, what would encourage them to go for those new roles. Um, creating opportunities to have more visible diversity in, in leadership type roles. So, you know, caring is number one and then calling it out. So where you see things are just not right, actually, you know, calling those things out. So whether it's female only panels and I know we're all co-authors on this book, so I will let that go. But, you know, gen gen generally, you know, we should look to have a better diversity of panels and conferences and meetings. So when you're in those situations, you know, allowing or encouraging and being inclusive about who gets to speak, who gets to present. Um, who gets to take the minutes. So calling out where you see behavior is not acceptable, but also creating a culture within the organization where people feel comfortable calling out. And then the third C is around committing and genuinely like making a commitment. So whether that's, you know, leaders making a commitment, whether that is, you know, managerial people making a commitment and whether that's people themselves, you know, committing to doing something differently and making a change and then obviously measuring it. And then we go into lots of detail on ways you can do that within the book. So definitely go and buy it if you haven't already. Excellent little plug for that. Thank you very much, Shilpa. Um, one of the things I thought was really interesting that um, it happens to be, I, I know that IBM does it um, because I was involved in it. I wasn't, I didn't lead it, but I was involved in it. And I think it's brilliant. And I've, I know other organizations do as well, but reverse mentoring as well. So if you are, if you are an executive, finding somebody who is not like you um, to act as a mentor. And I think um, often it's called reverse mentoring because quite often it might be somebody who's more junior than you. It doesn't necessarily need to be somebody who's more junior from you, but you might find that you learn an awful lot more just because they have a um, that, that different perspective at a, a different level. But um, yeah, finding people, and a number of organizations um, have set this, this kind of program up. It's, I think that's really worth exploring. It's, a, it's amazing um, what you learn on, on both sides. And then, and we're not just talking about gender here, you know, there's all sorts of things that, um, uh, and ways in that we're different from, from one another. Um, um, Normine, I said um, I would come to you because you have your hand up. So let me just, um, uh, I'm going to ask you to unmute if you want to ask your question. You're very welcome to do that now. Oh, oh, you disappeared. I have a feeling you might not want to do that anymore. There we go. Our hands disappeared. Let's see if, is there anything in the chat? Oh, apparently you can't unmute. Do you want me to? I'm trying again. There we go. I've asked you to unmute. There we go. You're not on mute anymore. Please go ask. Oh, no, we can't hear you. 
tech that that's the fun of virtual sessions isn't it do you want to just pop it in the chat then maybe for um, we're definitely not on mute at this end just, just going to try and write it out so while while we the, oh see now we can see you but we cannot hear you well i see here you see you we can see your name Whilst Darmeen is uh, is typing that out, she did comment earlier that when she came to the UK, that was the first time she experienced discrimination against mm -hmm. her gender and and hadn't before, which I think is desperately sad. So um, I know it's it's really difficult typing it out as well, Narmeen, but if you, if you had more time to put something about that. So while, while you are typing that, um, I just just a comment on some of the, the that was made as well earlier, and that's that's, that's again come to me. Um, so the the company this particular person works for, they still have challenges about having um, uh, women in Asia in in more uh, more senior roles and the director roles that kind of thing, which I think we see in the UK and the US um, quite a lot as well. Um, there's maybe something to be thought about there about why again why are women exiting? What we can do to to help them the move? Or is there a lot of unconscious bias there about um, about what women do with their time and how they do their how they um, and whether they want to be promoted, there's definitely some some assumptions there. You know that thing where women hope to ex that people will notice they're doing a good job, and and men will ask for it. It's complete stereotypes, but people they, they do um, go with that. There are there may be challenges round about um, cultural expectations of what women are expected to do in the home. That can be um, something to consider, but it doesn't necessarily need to be a barrier. And also there are a lot of women who don't have children, by the way, or their children have left the home um, and are no longer needing to be cared for. Although we then have the challenge of potentially having elderly parents that we might have to, to look after too. But what are we doing as a, as a society, as an organization to um, make opportunities available to those people that have the kind of commitments that like the ones I've just described. So here we go. Let me go for that first question. Unconscious bias. I find that I get up, that I find myself putting myself down and I keep having to find ways back from the corner I paint myself into by finding reasons why I shouldn't be doing something. Do yourselves find the same? Any other woman doing that kind of thing in our panel? Any nods? Yeah, let lots of nods. So I think yes, we absolutely do find it. Anyone got any hints and tips for 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 preventing ourselves from putting ourselves down? You know what, Sharon? This time that I achieved something is the first time I've thoroughly followed through. And I find myself giving up as well. I'll do kind of five years at something and think, oh well, somebody's gonna catch me out now. So I'll give it up before they catch me out. And, um, and it's so wrong. You've really got to steal yourself, hugely got to steal yourself. And, and you've got to surround yourself by people like Sharon and Hannah and Clem and Shilpa and Andrea, who'll all turn around and go, you're brilliant, keep going. Because if you don't, then you will back out. You do back out or you do leave after five years. And so having networks who who boost you um is is incredibly important and and that seems like it's an immodest thing but it isn't it's just if we are to make a difference in this women in tech thing or if your thing was you know kind of net zero if you are going to make a difference and you need to succeed in things, then you need a bunch of supporters around you who believe in you and who you believe in, in a, in a kind of mutual way, so that you can all make progress together. I've got a brilliant piece of, of advice from Jill, who's in the, the audience, which I, I love as well. So Jill has said, before you say something about yourself, think about if you heard it um, um, said about somebody else, would you find it offensive or discriminatory? If you wouldn't say it about someone else, don't say it about yourself. Um, that is that is lovely. And we just have to learn how to to, to stop ourselves um, getting to that. So um, I, I, do, I do like that. Um, yeah, I'm just and, checking to and, see. And similarly, if you say it, if you were to say, if someone was to say it to, to you, how would you feel? I mean, we're our biggest critics. Um, 
And I think maybe, I mean, what you have to realise is that what you're experiencing it is very natural. <laughs> it's it's not something that is uniquely to you. I think we, we can all vouch that we've experienced that throughout our, our lifetimes and careers. So, so I think yeah. imposter syndrome is absolutely very yeah. common. And I think that's the, the thing. So we all think we must be the only people going through this. And actually, everybody, everybody goes through it. So just recognising, as you're saying, Andrea, how common it is, is a, is a really great first step. And then just trying to deal with it day to day, meeting to meeting, presentation to presentation, and building your confidence, but just recognizing that everybody goes through it, you know, even world leaders, famous world leaders have, you know, sh shared that they go through this. Yeah, and yes. I, I'm pre pretty sure that all of us had some doubts when we were writing this book. So. Indeed. <laughs> I know that I did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> one thing I was going to say is, I remember when um, I was um, seeking promotion to become a professor and, and I just, you know, I, my, the voice on my shoulder was going, what, you? Nah. Who do you think you are? You know, and all this kind of chatter that goes on. Um, and it was, it, it was really difficult because you have to battle with that kind of inner, inner self or, you know, and make sure that you... Uh, you push some of those thoughts away and those kind of doubts and, and believe in yourself and also start to kind of, um, I always found it's, it's good to kind of act as if <laughs> you are, even if you don't really believe, you saw that, right, today I'm acting as if I'm a professor. So you kind of get used to being in that role and you start to believe yourself um, being sort of entitled to have that. Um, and and that sort of starts to get you used to uh, a, a different kind of mindset about those challenges or those those kind of promotions. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that would help, but uh, certainly sort of just acting the part is is one step towards actually sort of uh, becoming that particular um, target that you're looking for. Um, Pete has given a really, really good piece of advice, I think, for the, the individual. Reflect on the things that have gone well, not the things that didn't. Um, I was at the Grace Hopper um, colloquium a few years ago, and I'm one of these people that tends to remember things about research, but not, not the actual numbers and nor the people that did the research. Um, but at one panel or, or, or one session, they talked about um, the way that men and women tend to, to deal with things. Now, based on, on some research I can't refer to, so that's pretty much useless, particularly to my academics that are here in, in, the, in the panel. Um, but... <laughs> they noticed that what happened when people were given a test, um, if they were told that they had passed the test, women generally said things like, oh, it was too easy, anyone could have done it. Men generally said, oh, um, of course I did, I'm brilliant. Um, and, and sort of women internalised and, or, 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 um, and men externalised the other way around. Men internalised, we're brilliant. Women externalised, or oh, anyone could have done it. For those who, who failed the test or when they failed the test, what happened is women said, oh, we're not good enough. And men said, oh, it was a stupid test. Nobody could have done it anyway. Um, so, and again, we're dealing with it differently. Now, this is, yeah, um, I appreciate that we are all individuals and people with, again, different experiences, different backgrounds, different um, neurodiversity might react differently. But it was just a really interesting way to observe some of the genders. So we deal with things differently. Gillian's waving at me. Gillian, on you go. Yeah, no, I was just thinking about, uh, you know, the importance of understanding how we are socialised as young males and young females and we take all this understanding on about what what is appropriate for us as females or males and and uh, and, and so as children you know as, as girls we're supposed to be seen and not heard and well behaved and studious and not um not bragging or boastful or and and as boys there's a whole different set of behaviors and and none of them are particularly, you know, they're not right or wrong in a sense. It's just that that's what we repeatedly get told we've got to be. And then we carry all this baggage around in our, in our heads about what we should be. And I'm sure it forms all of this. And, and if, we, if we were all really conscious about how we've been socialized and 
what that process was as children and what it is ongoing now, then then that would be a, a huge first step for the for those who want to do a bit of self analysis on this, because it really is fundamental to what you then take into your your work life um, and and the way you perceive yourself. Thank you. Um, I've um, I've missed the second question i realized that we've jumped on a bit a little so the second question that came in was about mentoring and recruitment practices that was from narmeen again in large organizations there's a lot of potential for mentoring support and so on but contractors and independent consultants seem to fall through the cracks it, absolutely um i definitely acknowledge that in smaller organizations there are few structures to help with diversity um yeah that that can also be true so anyone got hints or tips i know there was one from jillian directly to me which i would totally have answered the same thing and that is that's why BCS Women's here um, so one of the things that might be available to you um, is to look for um, networks that are a support for women that might be outside of the organization that you're direct, directly working for right now um, because yeah you learn so much more that's why I'm still involved in BCS Women it's not that IBM doesn't actually have um, resource groups focused on women and, and doing some good things there it's actually there's just there's a bigger and there's a wider community of other women which is just fantastic uh, to learn from anyone else in the, the panel want to add in some su suggestions about um, ways to get involved if you maybe are that in a smaller organization if you're um, a contractor um, yes no go Hannah I uh I was given some advice a while ago which was if you want a mentor first off ask people and you don't you're not restricted to one mentor and you're not restricted to mentors that look like you and you're not restricted to mentors that are women if there's a guy that you really like ask him if there's a woman whose work you like ask them if they'll spend some time and maybe they'll be too busy but you can work out what what you want from the relationship and be specific and say actually what I'd like is you know one zoom call a year where we look at what's going on or maybe one zoom call every couple of months um, and if you're specific and you talk about what you want and you're open to those kinds of um, mentoring relationships that are maybe open to different types of mentors and so on, then it can be really useful. Um, and a lot of people will be quite open about that. But the other thing is, we've talked about reverse mentoring before, you can always mentor down and up. So you, the being a mentor yourself will give, will be a learning experience for you as well as for the person you're mentoring, if you understand me. Does that make sense? Got a bit flaky towards the end there. No, I no, think, I think it was, yeah, I was going to say it's great advice, Anna. And I think the other thing about being involved, at, like with an organisation like the BCS, is it provides um, an independent perspective than, that you wouldn't get in a large corporation. Um, it gives you the opportunity to try things out <clears throat> that you wouldn't necessarily, you know, that you don't. No one's going to be assessing whether you pass an, your your annual performance review. You get a chance to practice doing presentations or things outside. You, you know, you, it's a whole host of different things that you can do that, that no one's going to judge you on. I think that's an, an important aspect of being involved with something like BCS and BCS Women. Yes, yeah, um, if they don't let you pass the glass ceiling at work, yeah. then get past the glass ceiling in an organisation like BCS Women, you know, and, and go and work on a board or a committee external to work and your skills then are just, you know, so enhanced. So it opens up a whole load of new opportunities for yeah. you. I think part of the question was also around recruitment practices in smaller organizations. And I think you can still, you know, learn from some of the things that do work in bigger organizations and ignore the bits that don't. I think, you know, that's the beauty of sometimes being in a smaller organization where you can feel like you potentially can have more influence in, um, you know, shaping the culture. So talk to your recruitment suppliers, talk to them about, you know, 50-50 shortlists, you know, some of those practices that maybe big organizations are doing can work equally well, and you might be able to actually deliver them a lot faster in a smaller organization too. So use that to your advantage, I think. 
we've talked an awful lot um, about um, what kind of people that are already in tech at this point in time. Um, but I'm conscious that at least at least I um, one six. How many chapters do we have again? I should know that. But one <laughs> anyway, um, we we do talk a, b a bit more about what we can do in terms when it comes to schools and and to younger children uh, or with younger children. I'm conscious that there will be there'll be parents, there'll be aunts and uncles, there'll be carers that um, in, in our audience as well. Hannah, would you mind if I come back to you and just put you on the spot for just a minute, just um, maybe it's just to summarize some things that you think would be really useful to to um, think about those really early career things. So I mean, one of the things you find when you look into tech and young people, like really young people, is how horribly early girls are dissuaded from getting involved in this stuff. So um, um, I've told this anecdote before. So if you've heard it before, I apologize. But my nephew, when he was five, had a science themed birthday party where they turned a kitchen into a laboratory and they made potions and everything. And he invited uh, his friends and he was five. So they were a mixed group. And one of the girls says, I can't come because science is for boys. And that's a five year old has already said this, right? And this, this gendered nature of science and technology where kids are really good at picking up what's for them and what isn't for them, right? You go into a toy shop, it's becoming a bit less pink versus all the other colors. But most toy shops, you can still tell immediately if you're in the girls' aisle or the boys' aisle. And the girls' aisle is pink and the boys' aisle has got all of the other colours. And the girls' aisle has got stuff to do with caring. And the boys' aisle has got stuff to do with science and computers and stuff. And this, kids will know what, what one they're in and what one is for them really, 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 really early, like before they go to school before they go to nursery, they will be aware that computing is not for them because they know that science and STEM and all of this is not for them. And I think against a background like this, it's very difficult for those of us who work with 18 year olds in a university to actually shift the dial much, right? Because people's preconceptions have been formed maybe 15 years before they come anywhere near a university, right? And I think what we can all do to try and get around this is to try not to buy our nieces and nephews toys that are quite so absurdly gendered. And let's try get, just get everybody Lego or something, you know? I, I know even have- a sensible answer. And but so it's a I'm... difficult question to ask, answer because it's just such a big problem. And you're probably in this situation also preaching to the converted for want of a slightly less religious phrase. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there, but, but I think raising that awareness um, is really important so that we do think about our, our actions more about when we are with uh, young children and yeah. how we can potentially set a, a good, strong message for, for others. I was really disappointed with Lego recently. Um, so I'm a huge Lego fan. I have lots of Lego still. Um, and I really regret getting rid of it when I left home. Anyway, um, then there was a magazine um I shared, I shared it on twitter and and there were some young girls and they well we can't speak to those scientists they'll not speak to us because we're yeah. girls and i couldn't work out if that was because of an age thing or because they felt that they wouldn't speak to to um, women and i thought oh, lego what happened um i was yeah. really surprised at that as a as a brand yeah. sort of yeah, it's I, not their brand I, I, I think they are trying to change though that that aren't they since yeah. the global survey was announced um sharon so they're now trying mm -hmm. to try and make sure they remove the, the gender um, um, bias within their toys but I, I, do, I do agree Lego is a fab toy <laughs> um, so if they can get that right then yes uh, definitely we've many a time bought Lego kits for our girls. Yeah. But I mean I, I volunteer in a, an after-school robotics club and I say two-thirds of the kids are boys and we've had people say but you know robots not for girls robotics isn't for girls and the robotics club is run by me and Trish and Andra and Tally and actually all of the women who well there's, I think there's two guys that help run the club everybody else is women and we've had girls say but it's not for 
girls and we've gone like hello hello look who's running it and they've gone oh yeah but it's still not for girls i think the other important part is you know for me i've i've worked with a lot of primary school kids in the past and it's about showing them um that it, whether it's videos or people going in and talking to the schools um about what your role is and i can remember showing them a video of a fireman and a doctor and a, a, a pilot and the boys were all really excited and as as these people walked in and gradually they took their helmets off and things and they were all shocked because it was a female and i, I think that's it's um also another part of it is you know the importance of role models if they don't see people out there that look like that them or could actually be be out there then uh, they don't do it i mean i can remember when uh, nadia hussein won bake off and all the kids suddenly felt all the girls said that they wanted to be bakers because suddenly the asian community had a, a role model that they could actually relate to instead of the, the parents all wanting them to be doctors and lawyers they suddenly all wanted to be bakers but i think you know it's about the importance of having the right role models and you think of brian cox and the difference he's made to to physics and astronomy we need to be out there publicizing you know good female role models in tech and, and to Pete's point as well, there are so many different roles in tech, absolutely. So I think there still is a stereotype of what working in tech looks like. And, you know, we're all here. We can show that actually that isn't real. But but also, I can't remember. I think it's about, you know, 65% of jobs still haven't been invented yet. So it's about really, you know, getting people to understand and it takes a whole village. So it's educating parents, carers, aunties, uncles, teachers, anyone in the community who's going to interact with the next generation that actually there's this wide range of choices out there. And we need you to help design what the future is because some of it actually hasn't been written yet. The other thing I wanted to sort of throw in is that these kind of choices, and I, I mean, I, I get that, you know, there are certain skills that you need to build up in order to have a technical career or you need to learn a certain set of things so uh notwithstanding that but i just you know a career choice isn't just a one-off and that's shilpa's point really as well that even if girls in high school are not choosing computer science or think it's something not for them there are many opportunities to switch or to come into the industry. And in fact, um, I can't remember which BCS report it is, but a recent one was, was showing that um, only a, a quite small percentage of IT professionals actually have a degree in IT and or computing. And actually, I'm one of them. <laughs> yeah, and many, the vast majority actually of people working in the sector um, don't come through that route so we do we can sometimes get really stuck with this sort of pipeline idea that we have to you know we have to get girls on this techie sort of technology education and if they miss that a certain point then they're lost and they'll never come into the IT sector whereas what we know is there are a lot of different routes in through other subjects or you know retrain do a degree in something else and then um you know i did that myself my first degree was in politics and history and then at a certain point i thought hmm, it that's the thing so i went on to did a master's conversion course um in in computing and the rest is history but you know it's it's that thing that we don't just have one opportunity you know there are many in our lengthy careers there's a chance to kind of move in at different points as well so um, I think it's important to keep that in mind. And also another sort of related thing, I think there's quite a lot of interest in universities now in um, hybrid courses and sort of getting this acknowledging that tech is so diverse now. So um, it isn't just a case of studying computer science. You know, you might 
come into technology through data science. You may have an interest in, in health sciences, or you might be coming into um, fintech through, you know, being having studied accountancy or whatever it is. There are there are many different kind of hybrid skills in the tech sector, and we're we're diversifying so much that we have to reflect that also in how we train people and how we even think about the sort of entry routes um, in, yeah. in a less narrow way. Mm. Yeah, and some of those routes are not going to be university at all. They will be apprenticeships and absolutely might be in an apprenticeship with a degree, but it, it, it might not. And, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. So um, there is, so that might be some folks who, um, yeah, for, for whatever reason, university is not the right place for them. Um, so and I know BCS has done quite a lot from an apprenticeships perspective, certainly south of the border of the, the, the UK that I sit in at the moment, there's an awful lot of work going on there. Um, because because those routes and apprenticeships not necessarily just for for people that are leaving school but people who want to retrain as well I think that's really important um, uh, to add I do have another question Shilpa do you want to add go Andrea <laughs> it was just also about transferable skills so not all of the roles that are out there in tech are super technical so you know you could be looking at something like customer experience and that you know understanding what it is that the user really wants you don't have to be super technical for that and there's a whole load of other roles that are out there that people could be doing and I think those when people I and some people have said it to me oh no I don't work in tech and I, because they're scared of that word so sometimes we've got to be a little careful about how we use it and yeah, I get conflicted because part of me wants to make tech as a word less um, less scary, but I know that people love the word digital and they feel that that's more um, inclusive. But um, yeah, uh, there is. We've got another. We've got another question. Um, I come straight to me, so not everyone will have. In fact, no one will have seen this apart from the person who typed it. So they, they've said, "I wondered what the panel think about tech orgs showing appreciation of female traits, especially in management, things like patience, emotional intelligence, championing." others etc i wondered if the feminization of tech if there is such a thing has meant these traits are appreciated more recently so um our panel do we think that um people are starting to appreciate some of those other qualities typically feminine i actually did um so 2019 Cambridge Uni published a study about the seven things that um, men are doing that they don't necessarily know that they're doing that is hindering um, women's careers and um, one of them is um, not necessarily being credited for their contributions and the detail behind it was exactly about that so it was some of those traits that might be considered um, more common in women might not exist in some women, might exist in, in, in full in, in lots of men, but typically feminine traits like better collaboration or stronger collaboration, um, uh, emotional intelligence, that kind of thing, was actually still holding women back um, because they weren't getting credit for it, even if they were very good for at it. Um, but um, what's our pal pal uh, panel experiencing around about those um, female traits? Are, are we getting recognised for them now, do you think? They go, Gillian. There was an advert on TV last night. It was for Barbie. I never remember what adverts are for, but I remembered this. And the advert was, dolls teach girls to empathise. And we, we so ignore the fact that as girl children, we're given dolls and we talk to them and we understand their feelings and we interact with them. And actually what we're doing is we're learning emotional intelligence and we're learning to empathize and we're learning to understand people. And what sadly we don't do is whilst we're all clamoring to play with Legos and not be down the girl's aisle in the toy shop, we don't take the boys down there and go, hey, come and play with some dolls because it's really useful. Because when you get to be a manager, you'll understand what your what your your team is saying. Yeah, uh, I, Hannah, you're gonna you're gonna jump in and go, don't be ridiculous. That's so sexist, Julian. No, no, I was just gonna chip in with a, an anecdote of uh, a, a fr friend's son was told not to play with a doll because dolls are for girls. 
and uh, his dad it was chipped in and said, no, what do you want? I mean, of course he should play with dolls. He might one day be a father. Yeah. yeah? I mean, these absolutely. skills are useful for guys, really yeah. useful. And, and I think what's really brought them to life has been the global pandemic. So people have been forced to bring some of those traditionally, let's say they are kind of classed as more female traits, but how are you gonna engage with your teams online in a global pandemic when everybody's locked away? I think it's just become more human to see children popping up on your conference calls and pets in the background and you know, people being a lot more flexible. So I think we've, we've had to do it and the smart organizations are now realizing, actually we need to take the learnings from this and carry it forward because things like the great resignation are actually pretty real right so you know i think the balance of power has shifted and people want to work for organizations who are demonstrating that those kinds of skills are valuable i mean if we're going to get to the singularity where you know code is going to be writing itself what are the skills that we're going to need it's actually empathy creativity um you know collaborativeness those are the skills that we really need the next generation we need to kind of focus on and I think organizations are on that journey um, to realizing that that's what they need to focus on for the future. I just wanted to to pick up I mean I absolutely was, well, agree with what you're saying Shilpa and I um, I've been having some interesting conversations about empathy as a skill because I think um, what we tend to, with a lot of these kind of so-called feminine traits or ways of being, we almost kind of think they're just, you're, you're, you're naturally that kind of person, or it's an, attributed to some, you know, whether it's biology or whatever, but, you know, culture, but it's somehow something that you have. Whereas actually many of these things are skills that you can develop yeah. uh, in the same way as you might develop technical skills or managerial skills. Um, and so these uh, colleagues that have sort of been discussing this with, and they've been sort of developing programs with, with companies about developing the skill of empathy and actually trying to sort of distill what, it, what behaviors are desirable um, in the, and, and ways to bring those kind of values into the way that you carry out your sort of work, whatever your role is. Um, mm. And therefore, you know, I think we should we should keep that in mind as well when we're thinking about what what kind of changes to make. Is actually people we can we can through training and other kinds of support help people to change uh, the way they interact and the cultures um, of organisations. Absolutely, and and the thing is, you don't want a team necessarily that all has exactly the same skills because otherwise it's not diverse. And if it's not diverse, it's probably not going to be as effective as it was if it, if it was diverse. And that's part of the reason that inclusion is really important. Because what was it, um, we saw, what was it, I think it was Joel who said a uh, uh, thing we were on at last week. You know, diversity is is kind of a fact. It's a thing, um, and you may have it and you may not have it. Um, but inclusion is actually what helps you keep things diverse. Um, I'm, I've just been trying to flick through some of the comments and then see whether there's been any questions that I might have missed because there've been so many. So if I've missed anything, I do apologise. Please. Please do put your hands up, folks, if um, if you've said something that I have missed and you want to make sure that you do get um, covered. Um, I'm conscious of time. We've got 15 minutes left and then we will cut at eight o'clock. I'm sure we could go on for, for a long time. Some interesting chat about pink. I was so conflicted on pink. I hate how things are made pink and cost more for girls and probably have fewer features. But I have a, I have a niece who absolutely adores um things that tend to come across as more girly. So if we can do something that gets her involved in taking stuff apart and building it, Lego friends, maybe, um, that makes her think about that sort of engineering side of things or how things are put together and solving problems. But it happens to have a tutu. I think somebody talks about pink tutus. If you want to wear a white pink tutu work, you absolutely go for it. Um, and that goes to anybody. Um, but yeah, there's there's a real challenge there. But as long as it's, if it's pink, it's not that it does less and costs more, I think, um, personally, as kind of my, my um, uh, thing on that. Somebody um, made a comment to me about an organization organization they have were part of our part of a small company and the challenge of hiring the first woman who 
didn't want to be a hire because they found out they were going to be the only woman in the team. And um, while the situation is, is definitely more positive now from a gender diversity perspective, um, you know, any any suggestions there um, from the panel, I guess mine would be um, get to understand where there are other women in the community so that you can connect them even if they're not in your company. Um, anyone want to suggest anything else? Hire two Go, women. Hire two women. I did think of that too, actually. I should have said that. Yes, you're absolutely right, Hannah. Hire two women. No? Um, yeah. Where, where I work, we have a policy that um, you don't have one woman in a tutor group or something. So that actually, that means we tend to put three or more. Because if you've got two women and one of them goes off sick, then that's an issue. So... I think there is a real importance to try and try and make there be a little bit more of a balance and being the only woman in the room is an experience that I think we've all had at times and uh, it's a weird one and I can understand why people might want to avoid that. The, the University of Manchester did some research on that a few years ago, and their recommendation was absolutely if you end up in, uh, in, in an academic situation, but actually I think this applies for work as well, it is better if you've only got two women, it's better for the two women to be in one team and the other team to not have any women than for those women to be separated and then be individuals. So um, um, un unfortunately, one team means that it won't have that kind of gender diversity, but potentially it will have other diverse characteristics that will um, um, add to its uh, success. But um, definitely worth bearing that in mind um, that women are not getting divided up and then feeling like they're still the only one, even though there and, might be others around. And there's a comment in the chat from Michelle, which is mm. a very fair point, which is that some people, this really doesn't matter. Some people are happy, doesn't matter. They don't, they're just colleagues, it doesn't matter. And I've been the only woman in a team loads of times and you just get on with it. Um, it just, it's just, there's a sense in which it feels unusual when you're not sometimes. And going to women's events and women in tech events where you're in the majority rather than the minority feels kind of empowering in a way that I've, I've personally, someone who always thought I just got on with it. I always thought I just got on, just got on with it, it's fine, doesn't matter. The first time I went to a Women in Tech event, it was surprising how much I enjoyed it. I mean, I went to an all-girls school, so I know that all female environments don't have to be nice. I think but sometimes uh, they're great. Leslie makes the point that, you know, you get told to be one of the boys or you feel that you should be one of the boys and then you'll get on and, you know, you muck in and you learn about football even if you didn't like football and I know women do but you know you learn about it even if you didn't like it and you learn about rugby because that's what the chat is going to be about on a Monday morning and and so even though you're all mucking in and you're all doing the same work then you know it's really difficult if if you're the one constantly learning about stuff that's not your field you know this is, this is um, there's, again, I'm sorry, I always kind of come back to the academic things, but um, it's what I know about. But um, there's a lot of people talking about this idea of sense of belonging. And uh, I, I find that quite a powerful concept because it really is uh, the key sometimes to some of the things you've been talking about, you know, if you are the only woman in the room. The kind of messages that you get which are kind of saying to you, you don't belong, you don't belong, you don't belong. Uh, and they can be, it's not that anybody's telling you that, but you're getting the kind of subtle messages from either the fact that everybody is, uh, everyone else is a man, or, you know, you are of a, a, a different ethnicity to everybody else, or uh, different sexuality to everyone else, or whatever it is where you feel like you're in the minority, um, then, you need to kind of find ways to ensure that sense of belonging is um, is is you you create an environment where where you can make people feel that they belong. And so, it, and it isn't always just about the kind of who's in the room. It can even be things. Um, there was a study recently which was looking at online 
um, learning environments, so online classrooms, and some of the kind of subtle things about what kind of, um, in these sort of virtual worlds, what kind of images were in the background in a technology class. And, you know, if it was, if it was all, you know, Star Trek posters or images of sort of things that were considered to be more sort of blokey or geeky, uh, some of the women felt, even, even in the online environment, felt, I don't belong. So, you know, these, there can be very subtle signals that are given off at all stages that make you feel like you're an outsider and not, not welcome or properly welcome. So we need to pay attention to the sort of symbolic things as well as the sort of concrete things. Um, so, yeah, interesting, I think. Yeah, the belonging thing is so important. I wrote a little bit about that as well, just because, and I, you know, we all did, I think, <laughs> you know, um, it, it, and it's that belonging thing is about where you know you belong to team, but also you can be different from the team as well. Whatever the team might be, actually that team might be the rest of your class. Um, it's not necessarily just in, in, in a work environment. Um, I'm just um, trying to scan um, for the rest. A few people are, are dropping off now. So the folks who've, who've stuck with us, thank you very much. Our panel who've stuck with us, thank you very much as well. You've not necessarily had a particularly easy time, although I think we're mostly all in um, um, vicious agreement. Um, uh, I, 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 who is it? Patricia has a, a fantastic story. Um, um, I've been the only woman in a team in a few places and it's been really horrible as everyone resented me because it meant they couldn't do things like walk around the office in their underwear anymore. <laughs> um, uh, oh my goodness. <laughs> Um, well, there we go. That, the interesting working environments. Um, I, I have to say, as the only woman in the room, I don't think I stopped other people doing that, but you never know, they might have, have hidden that from me. Um, um, I've, I've had a direct question around about statistics. So one person said, I'm a black woman in tech for 25 years. I'm troubled at learning that there are only 1% black women in tech roles. Did your research touch on this kind of statistic? Could you point me to any good reports or research articles that might explain the reasons why? Um, so um, obviously a real concern for them. I know we have a lot of different statistics in, in that book, um, all supporting one another, hopefully not, not necessarily contradicting. Um, did anyone touch this in particular that they can remember? And if not, we will get back to um, this person afterwards. I mean, just... Uh... I, I think in the chapter on the higher education, we had a few statistics in there. I mean, I think what when you look at, so this is of students that are going in to study computing. Um, there is there is diversity. Um, um, there is a, there is a quite a diverse cohort that go in to study, but I think it's when you break that down. So the the person who asked the question, if they're asking specifically about black uh, students or black um, professionals. Um, some of that is kind of hidden within a sort of that broader category of, um, for want of a better phrase, black and, uh, and minority ethnic. Um, so I think it's kind of complicated picture to, to drill down right into that. But I think what we absolutely know is, uh, as we've been saying before, you know, that kind of sense of belonging and role models make a real difference. We don't have that visibility of uh, black leaders or visible role models within the sector. Um, the things that we're talking about in general for women will be um, exacerbated for black women who don't see themselves represented. Uh, yeah, sorry. I was just going to say there's a woman that we've been working with at the BCS called Charlene Hunter, and she runs a group called Code Coding Black Females yes. that does address some of that. Some, you know, in the sense of here's a group, you can go and join it. And, and to the point that we were making earlier about go and join a group outside of work. And maybe that's something to do as well. Um, yeah. So, no, I think uh, Charlene, is, Charlene is fab. There's also um, TLA, uh, Black Women in Tech, uh, which is another fabulous organization. So I think that, you know, if, um, if we had a second version of the book, we would focus on a lot more on the intersectionality piece, because mm -hmm. when we're talking about diversifying tech and having more women, it's about having a broad range of women of different ethnicities, of disabilities, of neurodiversities, because that's what we really need to create the products and solutions of the future. But yeah, I do suggest connecting into people like um, 
Charlene and uh, TLA. And there was also the recent um, Black Tech Fest, which was, I think, 19th to 21st October. If you haven't seen that, I think you might be able to get some of the um, uh, learnings and sessions from there as well. So I think it's, uh, you know, one of the next challenges that we need to focus on and making sure when we're talking about women in tech that it really is talking about intersectionality. Thank you. And I've just popped a link in the chat. Um, a, someone on the committee um, very kindly behind the scenes has also found um, a, a report about um, a ethnicity that BCS did this, earlier this year. Um, so hopefully that will help answer part of the question, if not all of the question that came up as well. I'm conscious we have three minutes left. And if I can do arithmetic, that might be 30 seconds each on um, one last thing that we want to leave with our audience. I think we've answered all the questions. If not, um, um, I'm, if you can find me on Twitter, I'm going to shove that in the chat. Um, so if you want to ask any questions, in fact, why don't you just ask them at BCS Women? That would make so much more sense. Um, so do that and we'll see if we can answer the questions behind the scenes for everyone. So I've probably taken up my 30 seconds, but any last um, hints, tips, recommendations for everyone? And that could be for um, one that's directed at um, the men in the audience, or it could be directed at the women that you want to um, help uplift. So um, I shall well, do that. Shilpa, I can see you first, so I'm going to make just go, we'll go in reverse or this time around? Well, I think everybody on this call who's joined us today is a role model. So what are you going to do tomorrow to help create the next generation of technologists? So that's something that you can do for the future of tech. And for yourself, go do something tomorrow that's going to help you make a change, learn something new, progress your career, stretch yourself, do something that scares you every day, but focus on you. Fantastic. Um, there we go. That was, that was more than one thing, but love it. Um, Hannah? Um, I just say to the, to the women, women in tech in the audience, um, you, you, can, you can do it, you can do everything that you want to do, but you don't have to. So concentrate on the things that really matter. Don't spread yourself too thin. Um, it's possibly less upbeat than Shilpa's, but I think we're quite often guilty of saying yes. And actually, there's a lot to be said for a strategic no. Uh, a brilliant piece of I need to learn that lesson myself Gillian or oh, do we still have Gillian here we do yeah, no I am still here um be an ally to one another it's really important that we we're all kind of supporting one another even if it's you're fabulous go do this that's really important just big each other up because sometimes you are taking scary steps and you do need do need a whole bunch of allies and mates in the background. Thank you very much, Clem. Um, well, buy the book, that's a good tip. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think just what everyone else has uh, said, just uh, stick at it. It's, it's so much fun being in the tech world and you know, there's so many great, great women. Um, and if you haven't, LinkedIn or connect I don't mean LinkedIn necessarily but you know connect it up with with others spend some time find your tribe as they say and um, find a place where you feel comfortable uh, you can make it happen there's lots of great women on this in this network thank you very much Andrea so I think it's about having your a virtual board if you're a woman of people that you know that you can turn to to support you whenever you you need need it and different people will be there for different times of your career and your your life um but also i would also ask the women to to reach out to the men in their organizations and talk to them about how they could be a better ally because we yes we've got some guys on the call which is great um, but the women know that what the problems are, it's sometimes the men that don't. And so what I would ask you to do is go out and talk to one of your male colleagues, whether it be a colleague, a peer, a boss, whoever, and just say, I was on this call last night and I need to encourage you to get more involved or got some tips for you. Go and buy the, this book. It's excellent. <laughs> It'll help um, you create a more diverse team. I love it. Team. 
definitely a, a few plugs there. Um, I, I, I'm going to finish with just a plea to the to the men in the audience or the men that are, are listening on to the recording. Um, um, come to come to things that are designed for women make sure that you're welcome there there will be some that really to do what but most men are very welcome come along listen be a listen and get uncomfortable because you might hear some things that are uncomfortable and it might be because of you it might be because of the people you worked with it might be because something you've not thought of before and um, get uncomfortable but listen don't bring too many assumptions and um and yeah and then and then get involved from what you've heard um there's there's lots to be done for everybody um uh, if it was if it was if, if it's left to just women to make a difference then we'd we'll not see the difference that we need um, I want to say a huge thank you, we're not two months past. I'm sorry, everyone, poor time control, but that's what happens when you get six people all with opinions on a, on a panel. Thank you to our panelists very much this evening for giving up so much of their time um, and, and, and doing the, the book as well as actually the, the last hour and a half and plus the AGM for, for some as well. Um, we've, got, we've had a few claps and that kind of thing and thanks from everybody in the audience for the panel as well. So yeah, thank you very much, ladies. And to the people who have stuck with us, and the people who are listening on recording potentially as well um thank you for 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 your attention um, we we know this matters to many and and we hope that we can all work together to make a, a big difference so i'll be quiet now have a great rest of your week take care everybody bye bye <laughs>